Chapter 84 Peace Be Unto You This chapter is based on portions taken from Luke 24 and John 20. On reaching Jerusalem, the two disciples enter at the eastern gate, which is open at night on festal occasions. The houses are dark and silent, but the travelers make their way through the narrow streets by the light of the rising moon. They go to the upper chamber where Jesus spent the hours of the last evening before his death. Here they know that their brethren are to be found. Late as it is, they know that the disciples will not sleep till they learn for a certainty what has become of the body of their Lord. They find the door of the chamber securely barred. They knock for admission, but no answer comes. All is still. Then they give their names. The door is carefully unbarred. They enter, and another unseen enters with them. Then the door is again fastened to keep out spies. The travelers find all in surprised excitement. The voices of those in the room break out into thanksgiving and praise, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. Then the two travelers, panting with the haste with which they have made their journey, tell the wondrous story of how Jesus has appeared to them. They have just ended and some are saying that they cannot believe it, for it is too good to be true, when, behold, another person stands before them. Every eye is fastened upon the stranger. No one has knocked for entrance. No footstep has been heard. The disciples are startled and wonder what it means. Then they hear a voice which is no other than the voice of their master. Clear and distinct the words fall from his lips, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted, and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are you troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as you see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. They beheld the hands and feet marred by the cruel nails. They recognized his voice like no other they had ever heard. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? And they gave him a piece of a broiled fish and of a honeycomb. And he took it and did eat before them. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Faith and joy took the place of unbelief, and with feelings which no words could express, they acknowledged their risen Savior. At the birth of Jesus, the angel announced, Peace on earth and good will to men. And now, at his first appearance to the disciples after his resurrection, the Savior addressed them with the blessed words, Peace be unto you. Jesus is ever ready to speak peace to souls that are burdened with doubts and fears. He waits for us to open the door of the heart to him and say, Abide with us. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. The resurrection of Jesus was a type of the final resurrection of all who sleep in him. The countenance of the risen Savior, his manner, his speech, were all familiar to his disciples. As Jesus arose from the dead, so those who sleep in him are to rise again. We shall know our friends even as the disciples knew Jesus. They may have been deformed, diseased, or disfigured in this mortal life, and they rise in perfect health and symmetry, Yet, in the glorified body, their identity will be perfectly preserved. Then shall we know, even as also we are known. In the face radiant with the light shining from the face of Jesus, we shall recognize the lineaments of those we love. When Jesus met with his disciples, he reminded them of the words he had spoken to them before his death, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the psalms concerning him. Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the scriptures, and said unto them, Thus it is written, 
and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem, and you are witnesses of these things. The disciples began to realize the nature and extent of their work. They were to proclaim to the world the wonderful truths which Christ had entrusted to them. The events of his life, his death and resurrection, the prophecies that pointed to these events, the sacredness of the law of God, the mysteries of the plan of salvation, the power of Jesus for the remission of sins, to all these things they were witnesses, and they were to make them known to the world. They were to proclaim the gospel of peace and salvation through repentance and the power of the Savior. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. The Holy Spirit was not yet fully manifested, for Christ had not yet been glorified. The more abundant impartation of the Spirit did not take place till after Christ's ascension. Not until this was received could the disciples fulfill the commission to preach the gospel to the world. But the Spirit was now given for a special purpose. Before the disciples could fulfill their official duties in connection with the church, Christ breathed his Spirit upon them. He was committing to them a most sacred trust, and he desired to impress them with the fact that without the Holy Spirit, this work could not be accomplished. The Holy Spirit is the breath of spiritual life in the soul. The impartation of the Spirit is the impartation of the life of Christ. It imbues the receiver with the attributes of Christ. Only those who are thus taught of God, those who possess the inward working of the Spirit and in whose life the Christ life is manifested, are to stand as representative men to minister in behalf of the Church. Whosoever sins you remit, said Christ, they are remitted, and whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. Christ here gives no liberty for any man to pass judgment upon others. In the Sermon on the Mount he forbade this. It is the prerogative of God. But on the church in its organized capacity he places a responsibility for the individual members. Toward those who fall into sin— the church has a duty to warn, to instruct, and, if possible, to restore. Reprove, rebuke, exhort, the Lord says, with all long suffering and doctrine. Deal faithfully with wrongdoing. Warn every soul that is in danger. Leave none to deceive themselves. Call sin by its right name. Declare what God has said in regard to lying, Sabbath-breaking, stealing, idolatry, and every other evil. They which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. If they persist in sin, the judgment you have declared from God's word is pronounced upon them in heaven. In choosing to sin, they disown Christ. The church must show that she does not sanction their deeds, or she herself dishonors her Lord. She must say about sin what God says about it. She must deal with it as God directs, and her action is is ratified in heaven. He who despises the authority of the church despises the authority of Christ himself. But there is a brighter side to the picture. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted. Let this thought be kept uppermost. In labor for the erring, let every eye be directed to Christ. Let the shepherds have a tender care for the flock of the Lord's pasture. Let them speak to the erring of the forgiving mercy of the Savior. Let them encourage the sinner to repent and believe in him who can pardon. Let them declare on the authority of God's word, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All who repent have the assurance, he will have compassion upon us, he will subdue our iniquities, and thou wilt cast all their sins in the depths of the sea.
Let the repentance of the sinner be accepted by the church with grateful hearts. Let the repenting one be led out from the darkness of unbelief into the light of faith and righteousness. Let his trembling hand be placed in the loving hand of Jesus. Such a remission is ratified in heaven. Only in this sense has the church power to absolve the sinner. Remission of sins can be obtained only through the merits of Christ. To no man, to no body of men, is given power to free the soul from guilt. Christ charged his disciples to preach the remission of sins in his name among all nations, but they themselves were not empowered to remove one stain of sin. The name of Jesus is the only name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. When Jesus first met the disciples in the upper chamber, Thomas was not with them. He heard the reports of the others and received abundant proof that Jesus had risen, but gloom and unbelief filled his heart. As he heard the disciples tell of the wonderful manifestations of the risen Savior, it only plunged him in deeper despair. If Jesus had really risen from the dead, there could be no further hope of a literal earthly kingdom and it wounded his vanity to think that his master should reveal himself to all the disciples except him. He was determined not to believe, and for a whole week he brooded over his wretchedness, which seemed all the darker in contrast with the hope and faith of his brethren. During this time he repeatedly declared, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. He would not see through the eyes of his brethren, or exercise faith which was dependent upon their testimony. He ardently loved his Lord, but he had allowed jealousy and unbelief to take possession of his mind and heart. A number of the disciples now made the familiar upper chamber their temporary home, and at evening all except Thomas gathered here. One evening Thomas determined to meet with the others. Notwithstanding his unbelief, he had a faint hope that the good news was true. While the disciples were taking their evening meal, they talked of the evidences which Christ had given them in the prophecies. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Turning to Thomas, he said, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. These words showed that he was acquainted with the thoughts and words of Thomas. The doubting disciple knew that none of his companions had seen Jesus for a week. They could not have told the master of his unbelief. He recognized the one before him as his Lord. He had no desire for further proof. His heart leaped for joy, and he cast himself at the feet of Jesus, crying, My Lord and my God. Jesus accepted his acknowledgment, but gently reproved his unbelief. Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. The faith of Thomas would have been more pleasing to Christ if he had been willing to believe upon the testimony of his brethren. Should the world now follow the example of Thomas, no one would believe unto salvation, for all who receive Christ must do so through the testimony of others. Many who are given to doubt excuse themselves by saying that if they had the evidence which Thomas had from his companions, they would believe. They do not realize that they have not only that evidence, but much more. Many who, like Thomas, wait for all cause of doubt to be removed, will never realize their desire. They gradually become confirmed in unbelief. Those who educate themselves to look on the dark side and murmur and complain know not what they do. They are sowing the seeds of doubt, and they will have a harvest of doubt to reap. At a time when faith and confidence are most essential, many will thus find themselves powerless 
to hope and believe. In his treatment of Thomas, Jesus gave a lesson for his followers. His example shows how we should treat those whose faith is weak and who make their doubts prominent. Jesus did not overwhelm Thomas with reproach, nor did he enter into controversy with him. He revealed himself to the doubting one. Thomas had been most unreasonable in dictating the conditions of his faith, but Jesus, by his generous love and consideration, broke down all the barriers. Unbelief is seldom overcome by controversy. It is rather put upon self-defense and finds new support and excuse. But let Jesus, in his love and mercy, be revealed as the crucified Savior, and from many once unwilling lips will be heard the acknowledgement of Thomas, my Lord and my God.